Hello there, and welcome back to MFA Writers. I'm so glad to have you here. My name's Jared McCormick, and I'm your host. This episode marks the 29th and last episode of Season 1 of MFA Writers. Season 2 starts in August, and we look forward to bringing you more interviews with emerging writers from MFA programs around the country. But first, a special thanks to Hannah, my co-producer, who is the heart and soul of this project. I couldn't do it without you. And of course, a big thanks to all of our listeners, including Julia Smith, who recently wrote a review on Apple Podcasts that says, I'm hooked. Inside MFA Info. I've made my MFA choice, and now the podcast is even more valuable to me. I want to know what's being taught and who emerging writers are and Jared delivers. Now I listen for who I want to read and how I can get the most out of my program. Thanks for listening, Julia, and thanks to all of you who continue to listen and support us. Here's to another great season. You can find MFA Writers on Instagram and Twitter, as well as MFAWriters.com. Feel free to shoot us a direct message on one of those platforms or an email at MFAWritersPodcast at gmail.com. We love to hear from listeners. If you have a minute to rate or review the show, the best place to do that is on Apple Podcasts. Doing so will help boost our podcast as we try to boost these amazing writers. Finally, as always, thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome to MFA Writers podcast where we talk to creative writing MFA students about their program, their process, and a piece they're working on. I'm your host, Jared McCormick. Today I'm with Tarek Dobbs. Tarek is an Arab-American queer writer born in Dearborn, Michigan, on stolen land of the Chippewa, Ottawa, and Potawatomi people. Dobbs' poems appear in Agni, APR, Best of the Net, Missouri Review Online, and Poetry Magazine. A third-year MFA student at the University of Minnesota, Dobbs is the assistant editor of Great River Review and the founder of Poetry Online, a nonprofit web magazine. Their debut poetry chapbook, Dancing on the Tarmac, was selected by Gabrielle Calvacaresi as the winner of Yamasee's 2020 Poetry Chapbook Contest. Today, Tarek has brought two poems to read for us. Awesome, yes. Thank you for having me. Um, So this first poem I'm going to read is called Poem Where Every Bird is a Drone. And as a brief image description, it is a tree um, with no leaves, um, just branches made out of the word bird. So you have b, you have erd, you have bird, you have b, you have kind of all these like different shortened and elongated sounds of the word bird. Um, But I guess as an auditory description, uh, this poem would normally be read uh, with several people, so you kind of get a droning of the word bird, so it kind of all blends together. And I will move from the tree description to the bottom text. Man has always envied the bird, and now I envy the murder, and now I murder the murder, and now birds play back live on the air, and now dead birds live in the air, and now men call a murder champagne, and now men call sign murder champagne, and a man's fist pours a glass of champagne, and now his bottle hisses, and was it carbonation or the flutter of wings? And now they bird a house, and now soldiers behind a desktop sing champagne, and now they bird another house, and now champagne, and now they bird until a black out, and now the tree's murder is its own black out, and now a wall of murder, and now the conspiracy comes true a tree in which every bird is a drone. And this next poem I'm reading um, is titled, My Brother Was Born Both Ally and Combatant, and it is a duplex, which is the form by Jericho Brown. All voyeurism begins with surveillance. My brother's voyage ends in the Galilee. I dream of a wall across the Galilee. Brother tunnels under and follows sunlight. A hot light eats his entire body, like his warm gun ate his jacket's lining. His jacket's lining was wool, dead sheep, supposedly still living. My brother does live, supposedly, like his old state. He buys groceries in Nobilis some weekends. 
He buys groceries for novelists on weekends. I hope the city begins where the state ends, that occupation ends where the state began. All voyeurism begins with surveillance. Tarek, it's lovely to have you here, and it was lovely to hear you read those. Thank you. So the first thing most people will notice when they approach a Tarek Dobbs poem will likely be the form. Most of your poems are structured in really unique ways, like that image of the the tree written in the word bird, like you described with that first poem. And it's really, those things are like really striking to the eye. And, and we'll talk about that later. But as your readers move beyond the form and structure, what do you hope they will feel and think about and take away from your poetry? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think I'm trying to use visual forms and even just po- poetry forms, right? Like the duplex um, to take maybe like propaganda or a message um, to the poetry or to the reader. I feel like a lot of my poems or a lot of my visual poems were born out of like, at first reading a lot of like minimalist poets who are writing for me, like a more empty like politic or a more empty like poem. Um, And so I'm kind of like (laughs) filling these visual forms with research and like, and just personal experiences that like drove me a little bit crazy. (laughs) Cause I always I felt like I always felt like the politics were so like out of reach. And then uh, maybe the form is like something that's given me permission to take up space, which has been really exciting. That's interesting. So like there's the politics involved that you're trying to tackle in the poetry, but the form kind of gives you a way into those things. It, it, it makes you feel like you're able to better explore them. Absolutely. Um, I feel like maybe it's like the element of craft that like people are looking for in uh, poems about politics that they think don't have craft to them, which maybe is like me being my own like enemy or cri- or critic. Um, but I feel like by using the um, visual forms, it makes something aesthetically pleasing. So like, even if you start reading it and you're like, oh, I don't, I don't like that. Maybe you'll finish it because you're like, oh, but this tree is kind of cool. And the cons, like the conceptual like nature of it, I guess maybe is like a draw. Yeah, I mean, it does it does act as a hook, that's for sure. And before the interview, I was looking around online and, and I read all of the poetry of yours that I could find. And I found that there were a lot of through lines subject-wise. So there's a lot of focus on war and, and occupying forces. And, you know, just over a month ago, there were 11 days of airstrikes and rocket attacks that left the Gaza Strip in ruins and 243 Palestinians dead, as well as 12 Israelis. Many of your poems focus on this conflict and the people who live in or around it. What draws you to write about this experience? I guess my approach to writing about um, like Israeli and American occupations in the, in the Arab world, in the Middle East, in um, Southwest Asia, North Africa, I did, re- so I did research there. I spent about a month and a half visiting both um, is- Israel, Palestine, and Lebanon. Um, and I read this book called Hollow Land by Yil Wiseman, which is a, I guess, te- it's not a textbook, but like historical, like narrative book that details from an Israeli Jewish man, like that was able to work in the Israeli military archives um, before they closed them permanently to the public even of Israel, um, basically how the, how Israel is manufactured architecturally as like this really like violent project, um, kind of from the get go. Uh, so it starts in the sixties and then it, it, it goes everywhere, but it, it takes you through like literally the architect, it's called hollow land, the architecture of occupation. So he's kind of taking you through like how by land, air, sea, surveillance, like technology, like every dimension of their life is kind of under this, um, <laughs> Uh, control. Um, so there's really like, like the state is hollow, right? Like I think part of what drove me so crazy about visiting there was people speak of it as if there is a Palestine. Um, and really, if a government is defined by its ability to have any like autonomy or any control of resources, right? Like there's no, the Palestine has no um, control over their sewer system, their electricity, their water, their air. For me, I was just like, wow, this is like the craziest thing I've ever seen. Like, um, it's hard to, it's something that I thought was hard for people to write about in journalistically or in essay form, which I think is like something that I was really drawn to at first. Um, but in art, you know, maybe you have the leeway to like, 
um, if you can make it personal, right, you can maybe talk about it a little bit more. So um, that was the draw for me. And then also a yields work um, has just been super instrumental. Like I bet if you, if you read Hollow Land by Yale Wiseman, you'll be like, why is this person like just writing this textbook as a poetry collection? Um, and I hope you think that, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, a Yale is someone who like, I mean, there are just, it's a great example. Like there are so many Jewish anti-Zionists doing like fantastic work in the diaspora to like expose and talk about like really hard things that are going on in Israel and in the occupied Palestinian territories or in Palestine and in historic Palestine and um, even in Lebanon and Syria. And so I guess when I originally went to, I was, when I was a student at the University of Michigan, I did a research trip um, to Sakhnin, which is a city in, I guess you could call it 48 Palestine, Palestine, that was inside of Israel proper. Um, and it was to study about how like the education system there, even though these are Israeli citizens of, um, these are Arab citizens of Israel. So they carry an Israeli passport. Um, they're Palestinians from 1948. Um, they get a seventh of the public school funding um, of Israeli Jewish students, even though they pay the same taxes and live in the same country. So they actually bring down the national test scores for the state of Israel. This is from 2018. So I could be a little bit out of date, but as I understand it, nothing has largely changed. Um, so there's like built in, um, I would say apartheid or like really serious, like inequality into their like actual society, like, right. Like into like what they define as their society. Um, and so that was also like, I think my breaking point was I was visiting there and I just started writing cause I was so frustrated, um, and scared and, um, just like blown away by like the lack of coverage and understanding that's extended in like a structural way, right? Like a lot of people are willing to talk about like, right. There was like these really horrible, like um, airstrike campaign on Gaza again. Um, and it's something that really won't end until there's international pressure, I think in the West. Well, I mean, one thing you said about making these things personal, I mean, you, you spent some time over there. I imagine you're interacting with people who are living through this conflict. One of the things that really stuck out to me in my brother was born both ally and combatant was how it kind of encapsulates both the like macro and the micro view of this conflict. The poem is about state surveillance and occupation, but it's also about a person who's living his life within and around this conflict, buying groceries, carrying a gun. And so I was curious about like, when you're writing a poem like this, are you often trying to get into the mind of a person who's living there? Are you thinking about a specific person or a character when you're writing a poem like this? Absolutely. So I try and stay as true to like a journalistic image as possible. When I wrote My Brother Was Born with Ally and Combatant, I actually was living with a ho- in a homestay um, in Sakhnin um, with like a Palestinian family or an Arab-Israeli family as they're defined um, by the state of Israel. And I did some interviews with him. So I just was chatting with him about, um, you know, what is it like to you know, how does he see his future? Like, what are they, you know, like, yeah, like, do you ever go to the West Bank? Do you ever go, you can't go to the Gaza Strip um, because it's besieged. But um, you can go to the West Bank if you're Israeli Arab. And so that's what that poem was born out of, just like chatting with him about that. And um, he felt, his experience felt very defeated. And it, I mean, and I can't blame him. I mean, he's living under like a really um, (laughs) violent, unwelcoming state, even though, so he was very brilliant. Like he was admitted to a certain college in Israel that he didn't attend because he was kind of bullied out of it. Yeah. Like how their interactions are kind of limited by the fact that they have an Israeli Arab passport. So they can't, they don't live in the West bank and they don't get to go there as much as they'd like to. And kind of Nablus is like this, I would say like stronghold of the resistance of Palestinians or has been right. There's been some stuff happening recently but just kind of like what what it's like for him to go visit there and like kind of see what could have been or what is. Um, And so, yeah, so a lot of the poems from this chat book and from this project, like what my brother was one with Alan Combatant are either like research from a Yale Wiseman's collection or sorry, not collection (laughs) book or um, interviews with my um, homestay brother um, in Sakhanin. How do you think growing up, and living in the United States has affected your view of these subjects and how you approach them. Absolutely. So growing up in the U.S., I grew up in Dearborn, Michigan, uh, which is the most densely Arab and Muslim city in the U.S. I'm pretty sure that could have changed. But for a while, we had the biggest, biggest mosque in America. Until recently, I think New York has that now. Um, we have the Arab American Museum. You know, my mom 
it was a teacher and now she's a gate attendant. She, uh, uh, taught ESL after school. So she taught like Arabic to, and she's from Lebanon herself. So it was very, like, very special. I mean, I got to grow up in a city where Arabs were the, were the majority, um, but also, you know, in the post 9 11 world, like the people that always joke, like at our mosque, like there are definitely, you know, CIA and FBI um, folks checking things out, kind of like this uh, Patriot Act era like world where um, everyone's kind of suspicious, everyone's kind of scared. And a lot of people, I was too, I was too young. Um, but I guess after 9-11, a lot of families were deported. If you d- aren't, you know, a U.S. citizen or a permanent resident, it's really hard to have any rights um, <laughs> in that sense. But yeah, I think I was really aware of the, the, the U.S. military project in Iraq. And um, that kind of was like a taking off point. And then as I grew up around and with Palestinians um, in, their, in the diaspora, I kind of got to know their story. And my mom was a, I'm an activist for Palestinian cause in for her whole life, I guess. But because of Lebanon, right? Because Israel did a land invasion and has bombed Lebanon several times. Um, so kind of in solidarity, I've always, always been on my mind, but I was really afraid to approach it until college when I took a class with an anti-Zionist um, Ashkenazi, like a white Jewish woman. Um, and she was super instrumental in like giving me permission to like think about this conflict and talk about it. and name some of um, what's going on there. Well, you mentioned that fear in trying to approach these subjects before. Where do you think that fear stems from? Yeah, I think I was, and I am still fearful of talking about um, occupation and um, really violent Zionism because there is such a push to to blackball um, people who are doing anti-Zionist or um, Palestinian solidarity work. Like you can see there's a website called Canary Mission that um, I think maybe has changed slightly recently, but is largely a website that doxes um, Arab or Swana people, especially at universities doing work um, in solidarity with Palestine. So that when you're trying to get a job, whether it be like, you know, professionally like finance doctor, or whatever, they're not going to hire you because you, they're calling you anti-Semitic uh, for the work you do. Um, or just the fact that there are still, there are still professors that are teaching super um, violent, like Aaronist, like, <laughs> Uh, versions of the conflict, as it's called. Um, and so I think just because there is a mainstream Zionism or anti-Palestinian, I guess, movement, it's hard to feel safe speaking out about it without like losing, um, I don't know, losing whatever you're trying to get, whether it's like a job or like a life um, or just being like targeted. Like I, during this most recent wave of um, bombings in Gaza and the displacement of Sheikh Jarrah or the violent occupation of Sheikh Jarrah, um, among other places. Um, I got death threats on Twitter and Instagram. <laughs> yeah, I think, so I guess the fear in some ways is like validated by that, but also um, we have mainstream, like, like I think even like Natalie Portman, who I think is, who I know is Jewish, but I think was actually born in Israel or is Israeli herself, like speaking out about the most recent wave of attacks, like there's a serious like tone shift in just like, how we can discuss it even, which is really exciting among celebrities and otherwise. Um, So hopefully things are changing. Yeah, definitely. You know, I've seen those changes as well. And I guess, or I'm wondering, like, if art is a way to talk about these things kind of indirectly, right? To like create something from them that allows us to approach them in a way that's acceptable or that makes people feel comfortable thinking about and talking about these things? Yes, absolutely. I think art is a way to, and maybe it's always, it always has been right. Like I think the first art I encountered like this was maybe like art that was made during like the HIV AIDS crisis, right. That's like critically lauded now, but at the time uh, was heavily stigmatized and made a lot of people very upset. Um, Like about the U S government being like a murderous, like, you know, really, um, ignorant uh, place that let a lot of people die that didn't have to die. Um, and so I think that, yeah, like art is definitely like a powerful tool to bring, especially like if, uh, like I was privileged enough to like have like this woman, Alice Mishkin, um, this like uh, Jewish woman who was my professor at Michigan and to, like read a Yale Wiseman's text. Like I've had like really great anti-Zionist Jewish folks like teaching me. And so I feel like then I, it, it relates to my experience and I can incorporate that into my artwork and then, because it's not, you know, um, an essay, I don't have to try and, you know, um, appease like 
I guess, a board of people. When it, when it becomes personal, you're allowed, you have, I think you have more leeway and that's um, what's been really exciting. Absolutely. Right. And if you're writing an academic essay about these things, you're approaching them directly where like, if you're writing a poem about it, you can kind of approach them from an angle in a way, right. That feels safer um, to both the writer and the reader. Absolutely. And I think, you know, all poems are all writing is propaganda, especially creative writing. Um, but yeah, I'm like, I feel like I can be like, yes, this poem is propaganda. And like, um, if you don't like it, like, that's fine. <laughs> um, I hope you like the politics of it, um, or I hope you're open to the politics of it. Whereas I think in an academic journal or, you know, j- journalism, there's this maybe I think would I would call it an illusion of like, like a center or a, tr- a capital T truth, right? And so even if I'm like extrapolating directly from like, you know, like Pomer Everywhere is a drone where a Yale Wiseman tells us that, you know, I think in the early 2000s, um, the name for a kill from a drone in the Gaza Strip was champagne, right? Like that was the code sign for a murder um, of a Palestinian. So that's really exciting, right? To like be able to take this information that is like buried in a textbook and put it in your art and maybe have it read by someone. Yeah. And plant that seed in that reader's head, right? Plant that seed in their head to like think about these things and look into them a bit themselves. Because I, when I was reading it, I saw the champagne thing and I wondered, oh, I, is that actually the call sign they were using? So then I look it up and it is. And so that that's what I love about poems like yours. They're very artful. They're very beautiful. But there are these little bits that get stuck in your head and make you ask yourself questions that then push you to go seek out more information. And as I said earlier, the structure and form of your poetry is really striking. And one of the pieces you read today, poem where every bird is a drone, you described how that you have that tree image made out of the word bird. And we'll put a link to that poem up on MFAWriters.com. Take a look, give it a read. It's really, really beautiful. And many of your poems include imagery or um, an imaginative structure of some sort to the point where you you know, you describe yourself on your website as a writer and a text artist, which I thought was pretty cool. But I, I want to talk about your process. In general, what comes first, the words or the imagery? That's Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'd like to say a lot of the time it can be some combination. Um, I live with, during this MFA, it was my, my cohort, Torney Great House, um, who's just been such a force of inspiration and support. Yeah, she's like her uh, like her whole thing is she's like a 21, 2021 NEA fellow. Uh, her debut just came out from Milkweed Editions. It's called um, Wound from the Mouth of Wound. Um, but she is not a very visually experimental poet, but who's but someone who's very into like encouraging that. Um, and so sometimes we'll just be chatting. Like I'll have maybe like a thought. Like I think for Pomeroy for Bird is a Drone, I think I was talking about like the murder in, our, in a tree outside of our house in Minneapolis or something. And I think my original idea for the form was to actually have a tree that had birds in it um, and try and do that as an image, as a silhouette. And she was like, no, well, you know, what if it was just the tree? And so that was really cool because that was a poem where I had the bottom text and then, you know, the tree that needed to go with it. And I was thinking about trying to put the bottom text as the actual tree, but that obviously uh, didn't work out or wouldn't have worked. So um, a lot of it's just like, sometimes it comes together Um I feel like I guess the ideation of the image does come first, usually in some way, shape or form. Like even if I don't know where it's going, I have the image in mind. I write the block of text without putting it into an image. And then as I edit the poem, I shove it into the image silhouette and try and like fit the poem, the text into the image silhouette. Well, you said something. I think a lot of people think about writing as this solitary thing, like that you're just doing completely independently of anyone else. But I love that anecdote about how um, the image of the tree actually came from this other person. So how often would you say that you're getting ideas from other people? Or I guess, would you describe your writing process as collaborative in some way? Oh, yeah. I mean, certainly, at least for ideation, I feel like my visual poems are bounced off of so many, I mean, all of my poems, like my roommates, I write, I definitely write in community. So yeah, absolutely. Like from the zero to the end, like, I'm like, Hey Torin, like, what do you think about this line? Like, what do you think about this idea? And she just happens to be a great editor. Like she gives it to me very straight. Like if she doesn't like something, she's like, that's not great. And sometimes I still try it. And sometimes it's still not great. Um, but other times, yeah, like 
they'll just be like, oh yeah, what if you try that? Or what if you do that? And it ends up being phenomenal. So yeah, I think it's, I think, right. I think people tr- want writers and artists to be these like islands. Um, yeah. And like, you're allowed to have your influences, right. Supposedly. But um, I'm all about like from birth of the, of the project or the poem, like having input on, you know, forms or um even content from my from my roommate from my uh, community has been super exciting. I think that that idea that writers have to be an island kind of can get into the head of the writers as well, right? Where it feels like you don't have permission to bounce ideas off of people or to like read part of your unfinished work to someone and see if it's working. Like, but it's important, right, to give ourselves permission to collaborate with other people and know that you don't have to just go it alone. Yeah. And I think even giving yourself permission to be like, there are collaborative poems, like certainly, right. That people do write those, but just because, you know, you, it's like a workshop, like someone makes a suggestion and that doesn't mean that like, it's their poem now, I think. Right. Or it's their piece of art now. Right. Like, I think there's a lot of fear in like, you know, oh, if I accept like comments or suggestions from friends or community members, like that makes it someone else's piece of work. And I think in like an actual, like, like we live in a household of exchange. So like Torn bounces stuff off of me, I bounce stuff off of her. Like, I think in that scenario, it's like, that's just kind of part of the process. And I, I wish more people were like either open about it or just like more excited about, um, even like in the spirit of an MFA, right? Like being in community with your, um, with your cohort is like huge. And that's what I chose. Like I was, I did recruitment at a few other programs and I chose, uh, Minnesota for Torin because we were chatting online and I got really lucky and it worked out phenomenally. So yeah, I think it really also underscores the importance of community in the MFA. Definitely. And not all MFA programs are going to provide that same sense of community. So I, I love that you like looked for that and were able to find that. And also you told me that you got really lucky and that you were able to find a great mentor at the University of Minnesota in Douglas Kearney, who you called um, one of the foundational experimental poetry and prose writers of our time. So tell us about how important that relationship has been to you. Oh, yeah. So for folks who aren't familiar, um, Doug Kearney is a Black American um, experimental writer. He writes uh, largely, I think, nonfiction and poetry. Um, and I think he edited one of the best experimental writing anthologies, um, among other things he's done. He's written libretto, which is um, opera, right? Like he's written, yeah, essays, poetry, like books of visual poems. He just dropped show his first book of completely non-visual poems. Um, and so he's just like, his mind is everywhere. He has a hand on everything. And uh, it makes him, I think, a really good uh, mentor and person to bounce ideas off of um, when I was initially applying to MFAs, I had it in my head that like I probably wouldn't have, which I think is what a lot of people have in their head is they think, oh, I'm going to have a mentor and this person's going to read everything I write and they're going to tell me how to like, you know, move forward with this work. And I kind of saw like, okay, I need a community. Like I'm looking for the cohort to do that for me. But Doug kind of just like, I guess, blew me away. Like he is a kind of uh, living, breathing, like <laughs> performer. Um, like he sings a lot. He has uses different voices in classrooms. He's always drumming on different objects and he's really, ex- he's always really excited about what folks are working on. And so, um, he gave a few lectures to the like general university at large and I went to them and it, that just kind of gave me permission to take my, I think, experimental process, like a, a step further. Like I had not written, like, I don't think like a fully visual poem, right. Where it's just collage. Um, of documents and images until I read Doug's work, like the summer before my MFA. And uh, I felt, I felt super invited into that world by him among other things, like among like, you know, for our workshops, he offers um, like, I think like six or seven different workshop styles you can choose for yourself. You know, he's always, he gives like great, great close reading. Um, especially because the way the history is like a lot of like historical knowledge is really important to my work. And he's always been super like great about, you know, doing research to read my poems um, and kind of, I mean, he was at Cal arts. He was a, on the faculty at Cal arts before he was uh, offered this job at Minnesota. And I think that because he was working with artists who like sometimes give you a lot less <laughs> context uh, with their work and there's a lot more not reaching, but just like, you know, um, analysis, a lot of a different language of analysis that goes into visual art and maybe visual poems. I think he was just really prepared to like 
uh, work with students doing visual work. And that was really exciting. But yeah, I just have not met someone who is so uh, visual, but also so musically and like rhythmically inclined. Like he has, I have a few poems that use sample that use um, samples of songs. Um, uh, like this is poem home on the home on the range Gaza Strip that uses the song home on the range. So it's in diagram. And so that's, that's totally, those poems are totally after Douglas Kearney. Like he does a lot of work where he um, actually has a project where he rem- remixes a lot of Michael Jackson uh, music videos. Um, and so just seeing someone like bring other media, other, and even other pop culture, right? Like in which I love pop culture into um, like poetry has also been just super eye opening. And uh, even the like physical, the, the digital process of like how you make a visual poem. Um, he's definitely like taught me a lot about like how you can use different programs to create certain things and how you can even just find like, let's say you want some weird old text, like, yeah, you can open up Google books, set it to eight, set it to the 18th century and just like only copy and paste images from that time so that they're not under copyright law yeah from everything from like process to inspiration to workshop he's just been like super instrumental um like i think his first collection was chosen by terence hayes of the national poetry series and that was like 2007 or something so he's just been really he's been around the block and he really knows his stuff in like the art text world and that's just been um like having that knowledge and that mentorship has been just fantastic yeah, it must be really amazing too the fact that like you're both writing this experimental poetry and both his poems and yours touch on race and so you all are kind of coming at a similar subject but in slightly different ways and you know it must be amazing to have that kind of mentorship in your program and one thing you told me you know one thing that we talk about a lot Uh, in relation to MFA programs is the need for more diversity in the students and in the faculty. But you told me that it isn't enough for universities to hire BIPOC writers. They also need to focus on diversity of writing styles amongst their BIPOC faculty, that these institutions mostly employ white experimental writers, but that you want to see that change. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and mind you, like there aren't that many white, right? Like white experimental writers employed by MFA programs. Um, a lot of experimental writers, I feel like, have taken the turn into the art world, uh, where there's a lot more money and probably like resources to be had and appreciation. But the experimental writers I saw at programs when I was looking at MFAs were white, largely. And there's nothing wrong with their work, but I wanted someone who could engage with a uh, race or like critical issues in the Middle East. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I guess, I don't know. I was just afraid to like talk about uh, Palestine and Lebanon and even the Iraq war and Afghanistan with poets who'd never ta- written about that. And especially they also, MFAs also employ sometimes veterans um, or support veteran writers, right? And so veterans are a lot of, t- of the time uh, writing about their experiences in the Arab world, which are super, can be super Orientalist, um, can involve mistransliterations of Arabic a lot of the time, um, which is kind of hilarious and sad, which is something I encountered in, in Michigan because I was an undergrad there. So I took classes with the creative writing faculty of the Helen Zell program and um, was hugely disappointed by the white faculty there. I think at Michigan, I saw what I thought white faculty at, an, at a prestige MFA program had to offer me. Um, <laughs> and it didn't feel good. Um, and it didn't, it, it wasn't going well. So I think that if MFAs um, employ experimental writers, but also employ writers who like have more understanding to lend to their um, to their black, their brown, their indigenous students, uh, that can be really huge. Because it's not that I don't feel like I could have been supported by white faculty, white experimental writers, but I just think that maybe unless they've done a lot of research, or like unless that's their, unless they've been working with black, brown, and indigenous experimental writers for a long time, I just worry about like especially when you're writing about the Arab world, like Orientalism and just like discomfort, like their discomfort. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to show up somewhere and make, I don't want to make a white faculty member super uncomfortable about like my work. Like I would prefer that, like I go somewhere where there's someone who's like, yeah, I, I'm also writing about race uh, more ethnicity or uh, this war machine. And I am like super comfortable, like talking about these things. And like, like I have Peter Campion here, who's like <laughs> um, a white, very non-experimental uh, poet, and he has been super supportive of my work um, and is willing to like read and do research to uh, you know discuss and understand my work. So there definitely are like faculty members who can do that, 
and who are great at that. But I think, yeah, having Doug is someone who like both understands the like formally what's going on and also like maybe personally what's going on has been um, just really like helpful. I think like even just mentally, like not be, not having to worry about burdening, like <laughs> maybe a, maybe a white professor with um, trying to understand all of these things that might be a reach. Yeah. I mean, that makes total sense to me. I mean, you want someone who can understand the lens that you're trying to look through and also understand the nuance of these situations. And the fact is that most white folks have not lived this situation. They don't understand the nuance of it. And so it. I, I'm so glad that you found someone at the University of Minnesota you feel not only is writing experimental poetry like you, but understands the lens and the angle uh, with which you're trying to approach these subjects. I think that's fantastic. And let's talk about the University of Minnesota MFA program a bit more now. It's a three-year program with the typical tracks in poetry fiction and literary nonfiction, but the program encourages experimentation within those dramas. And you told me that there's a lot of flexibility in this program to work across genres as well. In what ways does the program foster cross genre work? Yeah, I think just, I think experimentation, encouraging it is literally as simple as like making sure the cohort like gets to know each other and has spaces to share for like classrooms, um, which I know some places don't have. Um, And also the University of Minnesota MFA doesn't have a million requirements, like in terms of like the actual amount of classes you have to take every semester um, or the amount of literature classes you have to take. I know when I was looking at Alabama, for example, when I did recruitment there, I noticed that there were a lot of literature classes you had to take and a literature like pedagogy class, which I felt like was really going to cut into like my time uh, writing and also just like wasn't in my inter- like wasn't in my wheelhouse of interests um, at, for like a studio MFA. I think that's really I think that's been really cool at Minnesota. Oh, and also you can change your track. So if you come in, whatever you come in as fiction, nonfiction, poetry. Um, you can change your thesis. Like you, like we have, we had two people during my time here move from, um, nonfiction track to poetry track, which is really funny and maybe, um, speaks to the Douglas Kearney effect. Um, (laughs) but, uh, I think if you want even like, let's say you come in as fiction, but you want to do poetry, like then you can write, you know, you can write your, you can write a poetry thesis. That's the length of fiction or the length of poetry. Um, they're super flexible in terms of like what you want that to look like. You know, if you get your book under contract, that we had a, a graduating student who just got a Penguin Random House deal for fiction for a novel, um, and your thesis isn't, isn't allowed to be under contract at most places um, or published. And she got that during her thesis, or I think right before her thesis started. Um, and so they were like, "Of course, that could be your thesis, right?" Which makes sense because you're still working on it. And also, like, are you going to you going to do like we're going to punish you for having like a successful like um, experience? Just generally the. The staff is, in terms of like curriculum, the curriculum is very supportive and flexible. Yeah, it's also, I think during my time has been a place where they build a cohort that is really diverse. Like I think we had eight out of, it moved from four to three per genre while I've been here. But my first year when it was four, 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 um, there were eight out of 12 where um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color. And I think like six or seven out of 12 were also queer. Like they've really... Uh, there was a change in who was doing admissions and it really showed in the uh, build of a cohort and also um, in how I think we all meshed really well and we're really close. Um, Yeah. I think just, I think honestly just building the community is, is what's made it so conducive to like um, experimentation or um, cross genre writing. Well, you know, and we talked about um, collaboration earlier, the more diversity you have in your cohort, the different lenses that people are going to be looking through at your work. And that's only going to improve your work, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, even poets who know how to, who might come in and, or people that are non-poets that might come in and know how to read your work. Like I've had Asha Tanki, who is a fiction writer, prose writer. She also writes nonfiction. And she's like, she loves Salma Sharif, um, who's a poet. And so she came in and she knew how to read my work and she was super excited about it. Yeah. Just like building cohorts of people who are like, uh, just have read a lot or like, yeah, like solidarity across like different, like black and brown and indigenous diasporas um, that are willing that like that are able to lend understanding to my work. Even if they don't, even if they don't aren't crazy about what's going on formally, they can say like, no, I understand this. And also this is really cool. And also like, here's how I feel about like the content of this work. And so you feel like the university of Minnesota has done a good job of like fostering that sense of community. So you feel comfortable spending time with the people in your cohort and bouncing ideas off people in your cohort. Yes. There is not a single person that I would feel like 
wholly uncomfortable um, hanging out with or bouncing ideas off of, um, which is important because the thesis workshop, I guess this is like the other end is like your final year, which I'm heading into is a thesis workshop that's taught as a whole. So everyone is together, like fiction, nonfiction, poetry. You're all giving each other feedback on each other's work. So it's important that I guess you're comfortable <laughs> with everyone because a couple of years ago, that wasn't the case. Um, and I didn't understand, I don't think I got that when I got here, but I think it's all very intentional to build a cohort that can mesh together across genres because if you don't, it's going to be really miserable um, in your final year. Yeah, I think this is something that most people who are applying to MFA programs probably don't realize is that the programs who are doing a really good job are the ones who are thinking about how the people that they accept will get along across genres and how they their work might be speaking to one another, right? Because that sense of community is super important. And so it could be that you might not get accepted to a program just because your work doesn't quite mesh with the other people they're bringing in that year. And it's not, it doesn't mean your work is not good. It's just that these programs are trying to foster a sense of community and lines of communications across genres, right? Oh, 1000%. Yeah. I mean, I remember my year, which I went straight from undergrad and I met a woman who like, she got into like, we like didn't really share any overlap in where we got in, but like she got into Austin I got it and I got into Wisconsin. So like we both got into fantastic programs, but they just like the cohorts were just very different. (laughs) And I think that's what we realized at recruitment. We were like, oh, okay. So like it's different. Uh, And that's really interesting to see like how faculty are like not only shaping to their tastes, but also like to their, to the, like, yeah, absolutely. Like the different students they have and how they all fit together. And, and the university of Minnesota isn't a huge program, right? They accept three people in each genre each year. So about nine students, I guess each year are brought into the program. So it's probably like a mid-sized program. How has that size been for you? Have, have you felt like, Um, You've been able to get to know people who are even in different years in the program and you have built those relationships uh, with students across the whole program. Yeah. um, So I toured programs that had, I think, like six students total across all years. Um, And I think I toured a program that had like like a ton. For me, Minnesota is literally a great it's not just I mean, I don't want to be like it's just right, but it really is Um, like if you have enough people, that's a lot, but also enough you can fit into a giant cabin in Wisconsin. <laughs> I feel like that's a good measure of a program size. Um, and so I think it's enough that like there's room if you don't love someone in your cohort to like gravitate towards other people. Like I think the, for me, a small cohort really scared me because I felt as someone who was really worried about the students, um, like, the, like, the, like the cohort itself, Um, There was someone I actually really loved in one of the cohorts that I turned down and I'm still kind of sad about not being there with them. But at the same time, I'm really, it's really exciting to have, I think just more people who can be in conversation with your work. um, If that's what you want. I'm glad to hear that. It sounds like there's a good sense of community at the university of Minnesota and the twin cities, you know, it's considered one of the largest literary publishing hubs outside of New York, Boston area. So I'm curious what kind of events and opportunities are available around the the city and if you're seeking out those events with other students. Yeah. So I, I would say this is probably the best decision I made, especially for someone going straight from undergrad to attend it. Like if you're not in New York, right, which I don't want to go to New York, but like I can totally see why people go there um, to an unfunded program or not to like be in that litter in that literary world. But yeah, we have Grey Wolf Press. We have Coffee House Press. We have Milkweed Editions. Um, we have Poetry Asylum, we have MISNA, which is the Arab American uh, Journal of Art and Writing. There's also, um, it's built into the, I'm pretty sure it's built into the Minnesota State Constitution that there's like a le- land water legacy amendment that protects art funding as well. Um, so there's really good funding for um, art here and writers. There's the McKnight Foundation. Um, there's so much opportunity. Um, like since I've been living here, um, like I did a reading with George Abraham, um, who was launching their book Birthright with Button Poetry. Oh, Button Poetry is also here, um, <laughs> and they were doing that through Miz- with Mizna, and so Mizna got in contact with me, and they are just doing like they just won the CLMP Firecracker Award for I think their journals, and they've been super supportive of me. Like they've had me do readings. Um, I'm guest editing an issue with them. I'm reading at the like art museum here at the end of the month uh, with all the different pre- with Grey Wolf, Milkweed, Coffee House, and Mizna. And yeah, there are just like, there are actual opportunities here. Like I obviously like 
it's not in good taste to discuss it, but like I've been solicited by like two of those presses while I've been here. Um, so like they have their eyes on folks here and also like, you know, cause who's going to be at your readings, right? It's going to be like Grey Wolf, Milky, Milkweed, Coffee House, Mizna, Poetry Salon. Like those are the kind of folks that are going to be at your reading. Um, and, and also other writers, like other writers on those presses are here and they live here or they come into a, a reading here. Or even at McAllister College, which is like an undergrad college here, there are like quite a few writers that are faculty there and even Carleton um, College in Minnesota. So I think just by being here, um, it's an affordable city, but it's also a city I think that's really that really is for writers and artists um, in terms of like just opportunities, especially in the Midwest. Yeah. And and you mentioned that Minnesota does a pretty good job of funding the arts. It seems like the University of Minnesota does a pretty good job of funding their students. It's a fully funded program. They uh, provide a stipend of around $18,000 a year, which is above average. We just got a pay bump. <laughs> Did you? Tell me. How much are you making now? So now it is, it's, it's, uh, it's hourly. So we make 24 24 an hour, which is, I think, 9500 per term. So that's, is that literally 19000 I think? Or yes. Yeah, because it was like 18500 Now it's 19000 <laughs> Um Nice. And uh, yeah, so there's also summer funding. There's really competitive summer funding. And now the cohort got smaller. So they give out about, I want to say it's like 10 different awards, like for different things um, every summer that are all between like 1000 or I think it's $900 and $3,000. Um, and so now with so few students, um, that is going to be something that's really great. And I think everyone, every year going forward now, including... Uh, the first and second year students, they're going to get $2,000 of summer funding. And that's not in addition to like some people get extra bonuses to that. So like my roommate got 4000 I got 2000 my first year. And then I also got a $2,500 summer award through like a uh, fellowship through the University of Minnesota. Um, so there are like, there's usually $2,000 in guaranteed summer funding on top of that. And there's like 10 different funding opportunities for summer. And there's the Grey Wolf Milkweed Coffeehouse internships, which are paid that you can apply for, which are here. There's also usually other things like I was a, a research assistant. I was I worked at Great River Review last year, um, which was like a paid position. Um, it's like their an admin fellow, I think it was called, and that's also twenty four dollars an hour. Um, everything the University of Minnesota is built at twenty four dollars an hour, no matter what it is. So that's been super huge, and just in terms of like, you know, if you need some extra money, like I had some built some medical stuff I needed to pay, and that was super helpful. Um, and speaking of that, speaking of medical care, we have. I think it's a Blue Cross PPO plan we have, and it's it's the state of Minnesota. So the health insurance here is the most generous I've ever had. It's much better than the insurance I had in Michigan. Um, I can see a provider, a specialist for $10. And most of my co-pays are less than $5. Um, I know like people have looked into having like trans care covered. Like there's, there seems to be pretty significant coverage for trans care here. And yeah, because I know that's like, it's like one of those things that like no doctor can ever tell you what they actually cover but um, I think the out-of-pocket maximum is two thousand is two thousand dollars for our plan. So this was definitely the program with the best actual insurance that I got into in terms of like because this this some states just have different insurance like. But yeah, and then the cost of living. I think the average two bedroom is for the city of Minneapolis, which a lot of people don't live here as well in the city necessarily, um, is eighteen hundred. Um, I live in a two bedroom with my roommate and. You can definitely find, like we, we at first lived in a house that was, I think, $500 a bedroom that had all amenities included. That was like, you know, a 20 minute walk from the university campus, a half an hour walk from downtown. So, and there's a bus system. We lived, we lived on two bus routes. We still, have on, we still have on one bus route that runs every 10 minutes. There's also rapid transit that was finished in 2013 that can take you to Mall of America from the airport. Like you can actually get in from the airport of MS, like MSP Minneapolis and take that from inside the airport directly to the campus and to downtown. So yeah, like when I've needed to fly, because my mom's a gate attendant, so I fly a lot. Um, it's been like, I, di- I didn't have a car my first year here, and I honestly did not need one, because it's a pretty, the, c- the city of Minneapolis proper is actually a pretty small city in scale compared to like Chicago or even Detroit. And so that's been super, super cool, like, because it's such a new, it's just the system is so new, because it was finished in 2013, so... I uh, am very appreciative of like the opportunity to live here um, for this time and also like have access to once you graduate all of the like state funding um, that's I think usually dictated by like you can't be in college during it. But then as soon as you finish, you're eligible. Well, that all sounds great. And I'm curious about the work that you do on campus in exchange for that financial package. So my understanding is that you're teaching at the University of Minnesota, Minnesota and that you're teaching creative writing classes. Yes. 
So this actually just changed, which I guess the, the fact that it changed isn't going to be relevant to anyone applying right now. But um, we used to teach intro to composition as well for one year during your second year. That is now gone. Um, now it's just intro to creative writing every semester. There is not a strict curriculum. Like you can write your whole, you can write your own syllabus. The only it's only contingent upon I think you have to have like three weeks of creative, three weeks of poetry, three weeks of fiction, three weeks of nonfiction, and there's portfolios of work you have to collect. So you teach once a week, which is great. It's only once a week. And then the other time once a week, there's a mass lecture for all the students in all the sections of intro to creative writing. But it's one of the also one of the only programs I saw where you actually get to dictate like pretty much the entirety of your syllabus and your class. Like you can literally teach whatever work you want as long as you can have students complete work. Um, you can do contract grading. So like I, my policy is like everyone does all their work. You turn in everything on time, you get an A. Um, I mean, they don't pay us enough to punish students. So I would recommend like going to a program that doesn't put a lot of like pressure on you to um, do that. Um, there's also fellowships for um, Black and Indigenous and Brown students. Um, I forget what it's called. But we so for this past year, we had a POC only year of admissions because of COVID and austerity measures from the university. That was the only way we were able to fund students. And so we actually have students here right now that are starting that got offered you know $25,000. They don't have to teach their first year and they get all the same benefits. So and there's also diversity, I think, funding for women, too. And we're all on the same insurance. There's not, it doesn't change if you're on fellowship or not. Well, another thing that I want to talk about is uh, some of your editorial experience. You mentioned the Great River Review, which is one of the, if not the longest running literary magazine in Minnesota. That's housed at the University of Minnesota. You're an assistant editor there of the magazine. What's that experience been like? Absolutely. Um, so when I got to Great River Review... Um, it had only been in print before, like physically in print. Um, I think we're on volume 67 or 68. Yeah. So it has a lot of like connections to, uh, I think fiction, I think for prose, like to the industry. Um, it's run by Peter Campion. who's a poet. who's like Guggenheim fellow and stuff. He's super cool. And I was, so my dream was like, what if this magazine had an online presence? What if it was run synchronously online and in print? Peter was super open-minded um, when I took the class with him because it's a course you can take for the MFA. And I took us from print to online and print synchronously, um, which has been super exciting. Uh, we got to like do a whole new website. We got to do a spotlight on Black poets and pay people for once. For once, because we we're not allowed to pay people, but we can pay people with. We have a thousand dollar poetry prize, which is either free to submit to or it costs two dollars to submit to, depending on how many free submissions we have left on submittable. Yeah, um, Great River Review is they're super open minded. They've been open to like accessibility, which I've had pushback with mags that I've worked with before about like adding alt text to your images, you know, having audio recordings of poets reading the poem if they're down to do that. It's just been like a super like open minded space for like, you know, kind of trying to make the magazine as a space for as many people as it can be. And just we had our first submission year where we were, we had had an issue out online and in print, which to me is very exciting. It's my whole shtick, but I really don't think people read print magazines from universities that aren't the biggest ones, right? Unless you can find them in a library. It's really hard to read these, these magazines from universities that like aren't a thing. I think being online is huge and really important. And you know, speaking of publishing online, you also founded your own online poetry journal called Poetry Online or Poetry.OML. Tell us about that project and your motivation for starting that. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, as I was working on Great River Review, um, it kind of like helped, was part of realizing my frustrations with online publishing, which is like, there's no alt text, there's no image description, there's no audio recording for like people with different needs. Um, if it's a video, there's no captioning, there's not very many venues that are experimental poetry, um, visual poetry, prose, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and so I was like, what if we made a journal that was, that paid people, <laughs> um, and that also was accessible, um, or as accessible as I can make it. And I'm super open to like any feedback or comments. If anyone's like, Hey, this isn't accessible. Like, please do this. I would love to please email us. Um, but yeah, poetry.onl, poetry online. Um, yeah, I bought the domain and was like, I let's make an accessible visual poetry journal um, or something that publishes that too. And uh, so like largely inspired by like Control V, which is a really fantastic experimental uh, experimental poetry journal um, and kind of taking the model of Palette and Frontier and all these other really great uh, dialogists, Hobart, like all these online journals and trying to be as transparent as possible about finances. Uh, not that any of those aren't, for example, but just like as like models of where I'm thinking. And like, so we're a nonprofit. I got 501c3 this year, which is really exciting. 
Um, we have our free submissions are dictated by how many free submissions we get from submittable each month, just like Great River Review, <laughs> um, through our submittable plan. And then when those close, we have expedited submissions, um, which we all read and vote on together, um, which I think are three dollars and five dollars depending on the response time. And we pay twenty five dollars a poem, which is funded by at first it was funded by me, but now it's funded by um, submission fees, um, which is really exciting. And then we also have a pot for like prizes. Um, Long term, I really want to have a no fee to submit poetry prize or a no fee to submit chapbook prize and accessible readings, like being able to hire like ASL interpretation, um, a captioning person, if not on Zoom, um, just like trying to create a space in poetry that is accessible is like super exciting to me. And then my friend Matt, who's working on this with me, is also running Prose Online, which is um, not as big yet, but pros at ONL. Um, we're also doing a flash nonfiction fiction journal over there, um, which I think the rate is fifteen dollars right now per piece for that. But you get to report it, or we'll report it for you, um, which I think is really cool. A lot of journals don't have that, and then also we'll raise the rate as soon as we have. We're not bleeding money, um, <laughs> which is always the venture in literature is not bleeding money. And more editing experience. You your guest editing an experimental writing issue of Mizna. How's that going? Yeah. Um, so yeah, again, like Misna is the uh, journal in the in the English speaking world for um, Arab and Swana writers, um, and even not like if you want to submit um, and you feel like you're in community with us, like please submit and let's talk about your work. But yeah, we're paying two hundred dollars per contributor, um, so it's a great rate. We I think you get five contributor copies. Um, yeah, Misna just won the Firecracker Award from CLMP. Uh, they're doing such cool stuff, and um, I am writing the foreword slash intro for this after I get all the submissions. So I am actually trying to like create a, a diverse uh, experimental issue that is tailored to like who submits, um, which is really exciting. Yeah, we'll take we take up to ten pages of anything, um, and it's just been like such an honor, I guess, to like get the opportunity to um, kind of try and curate like experimental voices in my community in our community because it's like even sitting down for like if i was going to solicit people we were all talking and i was just like yeah like who do i still like who <laughs> who are who are we looking at because i feel like my and so much of my inspiration has been from folks like douglas kearney or just people outside of the like arab swana canon and so yeah trying to like make space for that has been also really exciting well, I can't wait to read it. And I also can't wait to read your new poetry chapbook, Dancing on the Tarmac, which won Yamasee's 2020 Poetry Chapbook Contest and just came out in print. Is that right? Yes. So um, Yamasee will be sharing uh, their supply of it soon. Um, I think they're going through like a little bit of a summer shift because they're also, they're run out of the University of South Carolina. But I have my copies. They're on my website, just tarkdo.com. Or if you know if you know how to use an emoji keyboard, it's the Nazar Evil Eye emoji, the lips emoji, and then the Nazar Evil Eye emoji dot WS is the actual website. <laughs> and that will take you to uh, my website where you can buy my chap. Uh, and or if you're like if you're in need, um, I'm also open to just like sending you a copy, like, you know, for free. Um, I don't want it to be like a barrier to anyone. <laughs> so um, so yeah, it's been super exciting. Um, yeah, selected by Gabriel Calvo Caressi, who's like one of our lovely, lovely elder queer writers. Hopefully it's unoffensive, um, but I've looked up to them for so long um, and really excited to be recognized by them. Well, congratulations. It's awesome. I'm so excited for you. I love your poetry, so I can't wait to get my hands on a copy of that as well. I'll definitely be ordering one. And before we go, I just want to give you the last word. If there's anything we missed or if there's any advice you have for listeners thinking about an MFA. Yeah, I mean, I think we covered everything super well. I would say if you're considering an MFA, <laughs> uh, follow your heart and try and get funding. Um, I know it's really tempting to maybe, especially if you're like me, who I was applying to MFA straight out of undergrad, I was super intimidated um, and really considered if I, wasn't, if I didn't get into a funded program, applying to an unfunded or attending an unfunded program. But I would say, want more for yourself. Um, you deserve more. You deserve to be valued by the institution in some way. <laughs> yeah, um, just be brave and shake. If you're if you're low income, shake down the universities for fee waivers. They will give them to you, but you have to beg and plead. Um, <laughs> that's I think that's a pretty practical piece of advice. So yeah. don't 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 let them not give you the fee waiver. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note. Tarek, thank you so much for stopping in, for chatting with me. This has been fantastic. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. <laughs>